Good evening, everyone. John, thank you so much. And thank you for your being our pastor for so many years there in Friendswood. And it really is a shame that you don't get to hear him preach because he was a wonderful preacher with a great message every Sunday. What John didn't tell you is uh, the Sunday that we walked in the church the first time, we happened to come in a side door, which it was the kitchen <coughs> for the church, and there was this elderly, bald-headed guy standing there making coffee. And we introduced ourselves and asked him if he could show us where the sanctuary was at. And he kindly quit what he was doing and showed us to our seats. And uh, we got there a little bit early, so we were kind of sitting there, kind of getting uh, accustomed to the facilities. And uh, shortly thereafter, the service started. And this guy who had been making the coffee walked down the center aisle up to the pulpit and sat down in his chair. My wife and I looked at each other and went, oh, that's the minister. <laughs> it was a great introduction, John. Thank you. Uh, and Richard and I go back quite a ways also. Um, we met, I don't know, what year was that? 90-something. Yeah, 90-something. We, we did a uh, missions trip down to Homestead, Florida, where we were working on the building of a Haitian community Sunday school building. And that was just a year or so before the Hurricane Andrew went through. And we did a pretty good job because it was one of the few buildings that was still left standing in Homestead, Florida after the hurricane went through. But you never know what, uh, what things are going to lead to, right? So uh, Richard and I were at a Methodist uh, meeting down in uh, Conroe last fall. And Richard said, I've got a great deal for you. How would you like to come to Gilmer? I said, what's that? I've since learned that Gilmer is where Johnny Mathis was born. Did you guys know that? Wow. So that's pretty cool. My wife and I are going to go see uh, Johnny Mathis on Sunday evening at the Opera House in, uh, in Galveston. So we found that out uh, last night, in fact, when we were down there. So we're excited about that, and I was even more excited driving up here today to see what Gilmer looked like. So we've got a, a, a lot to talk about this evening, and I'd like to go ahead and get started. Um, what I would like to do is first show you a series of uh, slides from a PowerPoint which is going to show you some of the pictures that are in my book and from that I'm going to tell you a little bit about who I am and how I got to where I got to be and what I got to do and after that then I'll be showing you about an 18 minute long video which is from my most recent space shuttle mission which is back in uh, 2002. That was the last time I flew in space. So uh, yeah that one oop, oop. We're going to draw. I can't talk that fast. Right? <laughs> so um, these are pictures again from the book, and what I'd like to do is kind of uh, talk about uh, where I grew up first. This, that's me. Aren't I kind of cute when I was a kid? <laughs> With my bib overalls. And that's my dad's father. That's my grandpa, Joe Ross. And what you can't see is my four-legged best friend, a black cocker spaniel that's jumping up in my grandfather's leg here. Uh, lived in northwest Indiana, about 50 miles from downtown Chicago. A uh, very ordinary kind of life, very blessed kind of life. I had both sets of grandparents that lived within about a mile or a mile and a half of us. Um, great place to grow up. It's kind of interesting that I felt God was guiding me from the very early age. Um, about this age, probably about four, five, six years old, I started getting extremely excited about flying in space. And I know the kids do now, but this is what after this was before the first satellites had been launched into space. And I got so excited about it, so interested in it, that I, my aunts and uncles knew that I was interested in it. And they started giving me their life and look magazines, and I would cut out the articles and the pictures and put them into scrapbooks, and my mother would help me do that. And she even helped to type up captions to put with the pictures. And I had done enough of that that, next one, Richard. By the time I was in fourth grade, uh, this is the year that the Soviets launched the first satellite into space in October of 1957, and the U.S. followed with our first satellite in January of 1958. I had done enough studying and, and knew enough about the rockets and the satellites that we were putting into space that in the fourth grade when that happened, I decided that I was going to go to Purdue University in my home state of Indiana that I was going to become an engineer. I didn't really know what engineers did, but I knew they were doing that, and that's what I wanted to do. And that I was going to get involved in our country's space program. So I did go to Purdue University, and along the way I had uh, taken all the proper courses in junior high and high school to make sure that I qualified for 
acceptance into Purdue's uh, program, which is a very challenging one. Um, I, I, for the young people here, I didn't get straight A's. That meant that I had to pedal harder and work harder to keep up with a crowd that got things easy, which I think was a blessing because some of them didn't make it through college because they had never had to study before that. So anyhow, I was the first one in my, my immediate family to go to college. And uh, I think my parents were pretty proud of that fact. I'm not sure they were so proud of me when I did this. Oop, no, back. This is a, a goal post that we stole from the football stadium. <laughs> and I didn't let anybody see this picture until the statute of limitations had passed. <laughs> my, my freshman year at Purdue was the uh, year that Bob Greasy was a senior. And Bob was an exceptional quarterback, as some of you might recognize. <coughs> And he won uh, the Big Ten Conference that year and allowed us to go to the Rose Bowl for the first time, where we went and beat USC in the Rose Bowl game. I also went to that game and tore down the goalpost, and I have a piece of it as well, but we didn't get a picture of that. Next one. Uh, in addition to get my bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering, I also got my master's degree in mechanical engineering. And uh, this is creating some smoke and fire out at the propulsion laboratory out by the airport at Purdue University. This was a uh, study I did working on my master's where we were investigating different propulsion techniques for missiles for the, the Navy. And the next one. Well, in addition to my BS in ME and my MS in ME, I also acquired an MRS while I was at Purdue. <laughs> this is my wife, Karen. We've been married uh, a little over 43 years now. And uh, I think she was about 12 when we got married. Next one. Well, after I came on to active duty in the Air Force, I'd been in Air Force ROTC at Purdue. Uh, one of the things I got to do was to get uh, bigger rockets to work with. And this is a sled track out of Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico that's seven miles long. And on top of uh, this forward sled here is a ramjet powered missile. You can see the inlets are mounted at the back of the missile. And it has, this is one sled, the white thing is one sled, the gray here is another sled, and there's another sled back here. These two pusher sleds each fired for about four seconds each, and the rockets on the fire sled, the last sled fired for about 5.4 seconds. And a little over 10 seconds, this thing went from a standing start to over Mach two and a half. And at those conditions, then we could light off the combustion chamber in the ramjet engine and to do tests on that that we couldn't do anywhere else in the United States at that point. The uh, engineers and the technicians, by the way, that worked out at the track by this time started to know me pretty well, and they knew that I wanted to get in the space business, so they offered to put a saddle on that thing for me. <laughs> I declined. Next one. I, I uh, knew that uh, about the time I came on to active duty in the Air Force, the Air Force was starting to build a B-1 bomber, and NASA was starting to think about building a thing called a space shuttle. And a part of the crew members that were going to be on the space shuttle didn't have to be test pilots. They could be engineers or scientists or medical doctors or folks like that. But I thought, since I was an engineer in the Air Force, that one of the better ways to maybe get a leg up on the opportunity to get selected as an astronaut was to go to the Air Force's test pilot school as a flight test engineer, not a pilot. That meant that I did the same academics. So I would get to fly in the airplanes with the test pilots. I would get to record the data. We'd reduce the data together. We'd write the reports together. Data, uh, together. And would give me the same kind of background and experience that NASA had hired from when they were staffing the earlier programs of Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo. And so I went to the test pilot school as a flight test engineer, and I was uh, fortunate enough to graduate at the top of my class. And uh, this is a uh, former astronaut and then General Tom Stafford presenting me with my award as uh, the top grad of the class. Being the top grad of the class, I got as an Air Force officer one of those rare opportunities that you normally don't get in the military, and I was given the option to go look for my own job. And I uh, didn't mess up on that one. I went down the street there at Edwards Air Force Base, and I was, was able to secure a job flying on the B-1 bomber as a flight test engineer, which was, the B-1 bomber at that point was the Air Force's highest uh, priority test program. Of course, obviously, this is where I wanted to get to, and during the time I was working on the B-1, I applied for the shuttle program, and they had eight to 10,000 people apply the first time around. And I was extremely excited when I was one of the 210 that they brought to NASA in Houston for a week-long series of interviews and physicals and tests. 
but I was very disappointed when I wasn't one of the 35 that was selected that time around. Uh, subsequent to that, I got the opportunity to go to NASA and start working there as a military officer helping to integrate military payloads into the space shuttle. And the second time around of about 6,000 people had applied and 120 that were interviewed, I was fortunate enough to be one of the 19 selected that time around. And uh, this is a tremendous ride. The space shuttle sitting on the launch pad stands 180 feet tall. That's an 18-story building in more layman's terms. It weighs four and a half million pounds, fully fueled and ready to go. And at liftoff, those two large white solid rocket motors and those three large main engines on the back of the shuttle combine to make over six and a half million pounds of thrust. Jumping off the pad, four and a half million pounds of thrust in about 40 seconds, we're already going straight up and exceed the speed of sound. And about two minutes, we're already about 25 miles up and over four times the speed of sound. Uh, obviously, if you're going to fly in space, you want to go out on a spacewalk, right? And that was, that was my end goal. And here I am on the end of the robotic arm, standing in a foot restraint that I helped to design, uh, conducting some experiments on my very first mission. We did two spacewalks to look at different ways of assembling structures in space with the thought of maybe building a space station someday. One of the unique things that crews are given an opportunity to do is to take uh, an individual out onto the launch pad the day before launch. And this is my bride now when she was 16. <laughs> and we're sitting just outside the hatch of the space shuttle. Uh, this is uh, Space Shuttle Endeavor. This is my sixth space shuttle flight uh, just the day before we launched. And in, in fact, some of these lockers here may have been the lockers that had the food that Karen helped to prepare and to uh, package for our mission. She uh, worked for a contractor who did that for about the last uh, two-thirds of the shuttle program, actually more than that. And I used to tell people, and she didn't think it was too funny, that the only time I got a home-cooked meal was when I flew in space. <laughs> I think I'm far enough away from home I can tell that one. Uh, this is uh, during my last mission. I got to fly seven times and did nine spacewalks. The seven times is a world record. The nine was a U.S. record until it got passed. And here we are. Uh, that's me. There's a, the nose of the space shuttle. This is a U.S. laboratory on the International Space Station. This is S0 that you'll see in the movie here in a minute. That's the thing we put up on that mission. And I did the first assembly flight as well, and, and this is part of what we put up during that first mission. Next one. I just, I like this picture, so I put it in. It's in the book. Uh, this is me taken from uh, through a window in the space shuttle. And you can see the blackness of space. There's stars out there, but when you're taking pictures during daylight, your human eye can't see the stars just the same as a camera can if it's going to properly expose the rest of the picture. But you can see this little blue line right here. See this little blue fuzzy thing here? That is our atmosphere. That's what keeping you and me and everything else on the surface of the Earth alive. And it gives you a real sense of the fragility of our environment and the fact that we really need to be careful with what we're doing to protect ourselves and, and for future generations. But I also love this view just because of the beauty of the God's beautiful earth that he created for us to live on. We go around the world every 90 minutes, 16 times a day. We're either seeing a sunrise or a sunset about every 45 minutes. And every one of them is more spectacular and beautiful than the one before it. And it's impossible to describe in words what you see and the, and the realization that you're actually experiencing something like that. Uh, this is a, a banner that was given to me by the commander of our crew on, the, on my last mission. Uh, these are the patches for my seven flights just signifying that I was the first person ever to have the, uh, the great opportunity to go fly in space seven times. Okay. And this, what's, this is what really makes me smile. This is my family, my bride of 22. My daughter, is, uh, who is, by the way, going through the astronaut selection process right now. Uh, out of 6,000 people applied, she's in the final 120, and we're keeping her fingers crossed as she'll make it further. My son Scott, this is my daughter Amy, my son Scott and his wife Faith and their three daughters Cassidy, Katie, and Emily. And she is still cuddly as can be. Okay.
Okay, we're going to set up for the uh, the video now. That's fine. I'll just set it up a little bit. We were a crew of seven. We had uh, a total of four spacewalkers on the crew. Uh, one crew did the uh, the first and the third spacewalk. Uh, that was Steve Smith and Rex Walheim. Steve was a, a veteran and Rex was a rookie. Uh, on the second spacewalking crew uh, with myself and Lee Morin. Uh, Lee was a rookie on the crew. Uh, and uh, we were both grandfathers going outside on the spacewalk. So the rest of the crew termed us the silver team, which was a lot nicer than some other things they could have used, so we appreciated that. And uh, like I said, a total of seven folks on board the crew, and uh, you know, we're going to get wired up here and get ready to go. I'm ready. Cut a loose. One of the hardest things a crew has to do is to design the patch and after doing it six times I didn't care what they did to the seventh one, they could do whatever they wanted to. As long as my name was on it, that guaranteed me a seat. <laughs> this is the crew coming out of our quarantine facility at the Kennedy Space Center. Karen always likes to point out that my hair is never combed. Again, the space shuttle, 180 feet tall, sitting on the pad and ready to go. Oh, he's four and a half million pounds. And some views from some temporary cameras that we put inside the cabin to show us getting strapped in. That's me getting cinched into my seat. 6.6 6 seconds before we lift off, we start the shuttle's three main engines to make sure they're going to function properly. If they don't, then we uh, don't launch. And I had that happen on one of my flights. And then uh, when they're all functioning and the clock gets to zero, we light those large solid rocket motors and it's a real kick in the pants. Now this is a camera inside the orbiter. This is showing you as the shuttle's three main engines start. You can see there's a little bit of shaking and that's when the solid rocket motors hit. A lot of vibration and shaking and a lot of noise. It makes it hard to read the, the meters and it makes it uh, hard to write things that you can read on your kneeboard. Again, four and a half million pounds going basically straight up and in 40 seconds you're already going faster than the speed of sound. It was a beautiful day there at the Cape. This is April 8th, 2002. One of my sister's birthdays. At about uh, two minutes after liftoff, we've already consumed over a, solid, uh, over a million pounds of solid rocket propeller on each of those white solid rocket boosters. They're jettisoned and parachuted back down to the ground, where, or the water rather, where they were retrieved and reused. And it takes us another six and a half minutes using the propellants in that large brown external tank to get us into orbit. This is looking out into the payload bay of the space shuttle as we open up the payload bay doors. Those shiny surfaces are radiators. They're used to reject the excess heat that's generated by the electrons in all of our black boxes and electrical equipment. We went right to work to start to uh, join up with the International Space Station and we're firing the rocket engines. I'll ask you to pull this checklist loose here. As our commander, uh, Mike Bloomfield, Mike was an Air Force Academy grad. This is Rex Walheim and Steve Smith, the other uh, spacewalking team. They're holding on to straps so they don't get splatted against the back wall there. This is Dr. Ellen Ochoa. Ellen was our, our flight engineer and our main robotic arm operator. Uh, you might be interested to know that uh, Ellen is now the center director down at the Johnson Space, Space Center. She's doing a great job. Here we are as we're getting ready to, uh, to dock with the International Space Station now. The commander, uh, Mike Bloomfield, is at the aft flight deck panels. This is S0. This is what we're going to add to the International Space Station. This is a view taken from the space station as we approach. Uh, it's about uh, 44 feet long and weighed about uh, 35,000 pounds. This is where we're going to dock to the International Space Station right here. And this hatch right here is where we'll come outside on our spacewalks. You might be interested to know that hatch looks straight at the ground, some 200 and some miles below you. It's a great first step. <laughs> Here we are as uh, we're coming in to dock with the International Space Station. Again, we're both traveling at 17,500 miles per hour, and we're coming in at a very, very slow speed of about one inch per second. Once we had captured, then we pulled these two halves together and we drove a series of hooks around the perimeter to structurally attach everything together. And once that was done, then we did pressure leak checks to make sure that everything was okay for us to uh, open up the hatches and go into the International Space Station. 
And the first person we saw was a Yuri Onofrenko, a Russian crew member on the station. He was the commander of this increment of the crew, and he had two Americans with him. Uh, this crew had all been up there for four months, and we were the first visitors they had. And they had another two months to go after we left. Now, this is uh, Dan Bursch, one of the U.S. crew members, and Carl Walls, the other one. You can see we're invading their, their space here. Dr. Ellen Ochoa is coming into the U.S. laboratory to get ready to operate the robotic arm. She has a bag in her hand, one around her waist, and another one between her legs. Efficiency. This is a real-time sunrise. Remember I told you we're going around the world at five miles a second. Every 45 minutes a sunrise or a sunset, and here's a sunset in real time as they're taking the robotic arm and lifting S0 out of the payload bay. That, that arm weighs about 1,000 pounds, and, and the S0 weighed about uh, 35,000 pounds. The S0 is the center portion of the truss, and that truss now extends over 300 feet across the front of the station, and on it are attached all of the solar arrays that provide the electric power for the station. But ours was the first segment of that, and it went right in the middle. This is part of one of the solar arrays here. And while they were getting S0 out of the payload bay and into position to attach it, I was preparing the first spacewalking team of uh, Steve Smith and Rex Walheim to get ready to go outside on the spacewalk. Great view. Here's the Nile River, the Nile Delta, the Red Sea, the Sinai Peninsula, the Gulf of Aqaba, the Mediterranean, and there's Israel and, uh, and uh, Lebanon down in here. What an incredible experience. I thought North was supposed to be at the top. What was with that? Another view is S0 is getting closer. This claw mechanism here is going to grab onto a bar on S0 and temporarily hold it in place while we go outside to do our spacewalks. It's kind of interesting to know that Rex Walheim was a rookie on this crew, and when we were in training, he kept telling everybody before the flight that between himself and Jerry Ross, they had six flights between them. <laughs> Sick human. Uh, Ellen Ochoa again with uh, Dan Bursch and they're operating the robotic arm and at this point they've got S0 temporarily attached to the structure and it's time for me to uh, allow the uh, first spacewalking team to go out to do the first spacewalk. Now one of the cardinal rules that we're told as astronauts is if you see a camera, don't wave at it. Nice going Steve. <laughs> Now this is the helmet mounted TV camera showing some of the work that Steve's doing out there in uh, the initial assembly work. You can see there's a lot of uh, fluid lines and electrical lines and uh, we had to do a lot of work to get everything attached together. S0 is kind of like the boiler room of the International Space Station. It had uh, miles and miles of wires and cables. It had uh, almost a thousand electrical connectors and it had uh, quite a few feet of uh, fluid lines. I'm behind that window right there on the orbiter, and that's where I stayed for about seven hours that day, reading the checklist and calling out the procedures to the crew outside. And uh, that was Rex Walheim you saw as he was manipulating from the end of the robotic arm a uh, electrical umbilical tray. And this is Steve Smith in the field view of Rex's camera now. They're uh, mechanically attaching this or fixing it to the structure. Then the next thing was to take these electrical umbilicals and remove them from their stowed location and attach them to the final configuration on the station. And this is how that's done. The two halves are slid together and then they push down that, that handle which actually makes the electrical connection inside the connector. You can see the rat's nest. This is the area we call the rat's nest just because there's so much stuff. Uh, that that uh, claw mechanism that I showed you earlier was a temporary way to attach S0 to the structure. This is the permanent way. There were four struts like this that had very large bolts. And this is a very manly Tim Allen type of work tool here that we use to uh, torque those bolts down to about 100 foot-pounds each. Who requested the train right now? Not a problem in orbit. This is my buddy, this is Lee Morin out on the end of the arm and he's holding on to a, a piece of structure that we have removed from the truss and we're putting it in another location to uh, stow it. As we build the station from time to time, just like you're building a house or something, you, uh, something else, you have to uh, rewire 
or reroute some of the signals and, and electrical power. And to do that, uh, Steve Smith had to remove that, uh, that uh, micrometeorite debris shield there. And uh, this is uh, Steve Frick inside the shuttle, operating the, ro the robotic arm inside the shuttle to assist him in that process. A great view now from my helmet mounted camera outside on the spacewalk. This is my last spacewalk. You can see this is the Russian part of the International Space Station. This is a light that I have tethered to my uh, wrist that I'm going to attach onto a strut and then take that strut and attach it uh, onto the station. Another great view of me out on the end of the robotic arm. What a great way to go to business, go to, go to work. This is the strut that I'm going to attach that light to, and then after that's done, I'll take that off and I attach it onto the station. Again, you can see the nose of the space shuttle in the background. I, my last flight, just like uh, four of my flights, four other of my flights, were all done on the space shuttle Atlantis. This is me going back inside at the end of the last space shuttle walk. A space station walk of this mission. I knew it was probably my last flight. I knew it was probably my last spacewalk. And it was a very um, depressing time, to say the least. Here we are back in the airlock. I'm already uh, mounted on the wall, and Steve Smith and uh, Rex Walheim are uh, helping do that. Uh, my buddy, uh, Lee Moore, and I thought we'd done pretty well, so we're giving each other high fives. Grandpa's in space did good. This is a, a little railroad uh, car that goes up and down the front face of the International Space Station. Uh, it was there when we uh, got onto orbit. We, we loosened it up and freed it up so it could move. And uh, it travels at no more than one inch per second, so we had to speed it up somewhat so you could see it moving. We decided since the, uh, the station crew had been up there for four months without any visitors that we were going to bring them some good old Texas grub. So we had barbecue with all the fixings, and uh, we had our... Uh, denim shirts and our red bandanas around our neck and we fixed them up with a really nice meal. The, spot, the shuttle is a two-story house. The flight deck is where we operate from and the mid-deck is where we do things like take baths. Uh, that's the hatch you get in and out. The bathroom is right over there. I'm sending an email home. The kitchen was right behind where the guy was taking his bath. And this is the boss right next to me getting some exercise on our ergometer. These are our sleeping bags back here. This is uh, the oven where we uh, warm up our food, and right next to it and below it is where we add the, the water to our food. You might notice that we don't use bread up there. We use tortillas to make our sandwiches. The bread spoils quickly and it also creates a lot of crumbs, so it's uh, much easier to use tortillas. You notice that you don't use a chair to, to sit and eat. You just kind of float wherever you want to. You don't get away from uh, housekeeping, cleaning, uh, Chores up there. This is uh, Ellen Ochoa and uh, and Rex, and they're using a vacuum cleaner to clean uh, lint and other things, food debris or whatever, from some filters. And uh, this is uh, Steve Frick changing out a lithium hydroxide canister. That's to get the carbon dioxide level in the air down to a, a good level so that we don't have any problems. This is me having fun at taxpayer expense. Thank you. <laughs> We're pretty busy up there most of the time, and anytime you get a chance to enjoy life a little bit, you, you take an opportunity. This is a rookie just about knocking himself out on something there. You see there's a whole bunch of stuff stored in there. This is just a quick demonstration of what zero gravity is all about and why it's important to be able to go up there and do all types of, of uh, research. You know, you know what would happen if you tried to do this in, in 1G. But there's a bubble of, of air inside that water droplet, and they just added an M&M &M to it. This is what it's like to sleep in space. You don't need beds, but we have these things called sleep restraints that look a lot like sleeping bags. They're basically to keep you from moving around, floating around in the middle of the night and waking yourself and others up. After uh, seven days of being docked in the International Space Station, uh, it was time to go home, and here we are closing up the hatch between us. Uh, we had another day or so on orbit. As I told you, the International Space Station crew had another two months yet. Dr. Ochoa, again, is checking out the shuttle's computers to make sure everything looks good for our undocking. Uh, Steve Frick was going to fly the space shuttle away from the International Space Station, and I'm down here getting ready to push the button that actually releases from the station. And once we were released then, uh, Steve Frick flew the space shuttle out to about 450 feet away from the space station, and he held it there until the sunrise came up, and then we did a complete fly around of the station so we can do photo documentation of the exterior 
uh, for the scientist and engineer on the, on the ground to study the condition of the, of the uh, hardware and also for future crews to use to train to the configuration. Here's uh, again another real-time sunrise. This is S0, that's the part that we put on there. And this is one of uh, four very, very large solar arrays that are on the International Space Station now. Very bright sun, and you can see the payload bay of the space shuttle now is empty. A view again from the International Space Station. And as we flew completely around the station, you can see sometimes the, uh, the Earth was below the International Space Station, and sometimes black space was behind it as we took the pictures. I tell people this looks like a Japanese tour bus with everybody fighting for window space with their cameras. But this is our job at this point, to photo document the outside of the station. One of the last views, again, S0, as we're getting ready to fire our rocket engines and to, uh, to leave uh, the International Space Station in preparation for coming home. Watch the thruster fire, see that? Pretty cool. Just like we have to open up the payload bay doors when we get onto orbit, we have to close them up when we're getting ready to come home. And this is one of the more significant events that you, have, you want to go right as you're getting ready to come home. Uh, we have to pack up everything we got out while we're up there. Flying in space is kind of like a camping trip. When you get up there, you set up a camp, and when you get ready to come home, you got to stow everything away and get ready to come home. And here we are doing that, and then we'll get the crew members suited up into their launch and entry suits. We fire our rocket engines halfway around the world from where, we're, uh, where we want to land, and about one hour later, we'll be landing, uh, hopefully, where the was intended. You grow about two inches on orbit, which is kind of nice. I could actually say I was almost six foot tall for a while, but it goes away shortly after you get back on the ground. That's because it's the same thing as when you go to bed tonight. If you would measure yourself before you go to bed and then measure yourself first thing in the morning when you get up, you're actually taller. That's because the curvature of your, body, your spine is, is less. As you slam back into the Earth's atmosphere at about 25 times the speed of sound, that creates a, a lot of uh, excited uh, molecules up there. And we get a big plasma sheath around the space shuttle, just like all the other vehicles that ever slam back into the, orbit, into the Earth's uh, atmosphere do. And here we are, this is a ground-based video as uh, the orbiter is coming around a wide sweeping turn to line up with the runway. This is called a heads-up display. This is what the pilot and commander see as they're looking out their windows. And this is altitude on this side, and this is airspeed over here. And this is the little guidance bug that's telling you where to go. There's the, uh, the vehicle assembly building over here. And you saw the runway down there. We come down at a very steep angle, about 12 to 14 degrees with respect to the ground. That's opposed to a commercial airliner that comes down at 1 or 2 degrees. At uh, 300 feet above the ground is when uh, the pilot puts down the landing gear. And we're traveling, you can see it, right around 300 uh, nautical miles per hour as uh, we come around that uh, final uh, turn to uh, come in and land. 200,000 pound glider, there's no engines working at this point. You only have one opportunity to make it to the runway. And uh, once you get on the runway, then you put out the parachute to help slow you down. And uh, once you get the nose gear onto the ground, then you can start applying the brakes to slow you down. It took us about 10,000 feet of runway to come to a stop. Okay, I'm ready for some questions. I hope you have some. Right back there. Make it nice and loud. Most fun thing I ever did in space is going out on spacewalks. Incredible experience. And I'll have to tell you, uh, on my third space shuttle flight, on my second spacewalk during that mission, I was out on the end of the robotic arm, and I was probably 40 feet above the payload bay of the space shuttle, and it was nighttime, and the other three crew members inside the orbiter told me to take a break because they were concentrating on working with the other spacewalker. And I turned off my helmet-mounted lights, I uh, bent back a little bit, and I was just looking at the universe and just soaking it in as best I could. And all of a sudden, I had this sense come over me that I was at unity with the universe. 
that I was doing exactly what God had designed me to do. To use my brain and to use my hands to be outside on spacewalks, working on repairing satellites and assembling structures in space. And I don't know how you can have a more uh, satisfying feeling come over you doing what you love to start with than something like that, that, that I in fact had found what God had planned for me to do and, and because of the talents and gifts that he gave me, I was doing it pretty well. Yeah. Tell me a scared time. Tell me a scared time. Uh, I think every time you're in a vehicle and getting ready to launch, it's kind of scary. I, I wouldn't say that it's scary, it's kind of, uh, there's butterflies, let's put it that way. Uh, you know that the whole thing was designed and built by the, the lowest bidder, right? <laughs> That's not the kind of degree of uh, confidence that you'd like to have sometimes. But I, I think it's it's just, you know, you know that you've been preparing for something for so long and, and you know that there's so much riding out. Like the mission before this one where I flew where we started the assembly of the International Space Station. I mean, literally the whole future of the International Space Station was based upon whether or not we could do our three spacewalks on that mission successfully. And that's a little bit of pressure. <laughs> so I, I think that's the kind of things that, that to really kind of uh, know at you sometimes. Did you do all your homework right? Did you think about all the right things? Have you prepared properly? Have you trained properly? Uh, and are you ready to respond to anything that should come up that wasn't something that is uh, exactly as you hoped it would go? So it's those kinds of things that can kind of keep you up at night and, and uh, make you worry a little bit. Where do you see NASA's future? <clears throat> I was afraid somebody was going to ask me that. <laughs> the question was, where do I see NASA's future? Uh, very frustrating time at NASA right now. I retired uh, January 20th of 19, uh, or 2012 rather, which was my birthday, my 64th birthday, and I wanted to stick around to the end of the shuttle program and, and then leave, and that's exactly what I did. But I would have probably wanted to leave anyhow because of the frustration level that's at NASA right now. Um, we had what I thought was an excellent plan that was laid out for us to, uh, to stop flying the shuttle, which I, I was okay with, in fact I thought it was the right answer. Uh, but we also had a new program called Constellation that was going to give us a new capsule that looked a lot like a Apollo capsule except bigger, carry more people, two new rockets that would allow us to go into low Earth orbit to take people to and from the International Space Station, which we're paying the Russians to do by the, by the way right now, and would eventually allow us to go to the moon and to establish a, a presence, a long-term presence on the moon to learn the types of things we needed to know that would allow us to eventually go to Mars. Great plan. They didn't send enough money. And any time that you're trying to do something on a low budget, you're going to uh, draw out the schedule and you're going to start to cause things to cost more than they should have had you done it right the first time. Enter a new set of politicians into Washington, D.C. They didn't like the Constellation program anyhow. They used the uh, behind schedule and over budget to cancel it. They haven't backfilled it with anything meaningful yet. And so there we are. And we have lost a lot of very talented technicians and engineers and managers, and the frustration level continues to grow. So that's where we're at. But like anything, it will get better with time. Uh, Congress is uh, continuing to fund uh, a new rocket and the once canceled and now resurrected new capsule. And so it's on life support, but I frankly don't see it looking real positive because of where we are with respect to uh, our budget process and uh, the deficits that we're running. So it's, it's not clear what's going to happen. And that's unfortunate because we're losing a lot of people that already were at NASA and we're having uh, more problems trying to recruit the talented young folks coming out of school because they want to do something exciting and they don't want to go somewhere that's going to be a frustration or nothing meaningful happening. So we'll see. Yes, sir. And the question is, will the private sector be able to make up for what NASA could have done? 
you know, we're, there's a lot of talk about commercial crew vehicle, which is a big misnomer because NASA is providing those companies 85% at least of the money that's being spent to develop those vehicles. And at the same time, NASA is trying to build their own vehicle, but it's at such a slow rate that the first time they plan to fly it is in 2017. Where if we had not canceled the program, we probably would have flown already or would be just about ready to fly. Very frustrating. Um, those commercial companies are, are in it for one reason, and that's to make money. And none of them, I think, can show that they've got a satisfactory business model unless NASA is one of their biggest, if not their most significant, and underwriting all of their business. And, uh, you know, it's, so it's very frustrating to me that uh, we're, we're calling it one thing when it really isn't. So what we're ending up doing is NASA is now trying to build four different versions of a crew vehicle and they're using about the same money that they could have used on the one that we were in the process of building and would have had flying about now. So we'll see. Yes, sir. Trying to get a feeling or visualize what it would be like to be out there and see the moon and see the earth and see stars. I don't think, I don't think we could comprehend what that is. Okay, the question is, what is it like to be outside on a spacewalk and being able to see the Earth over here, the Moon over there, and all the stars out there. Uh, I'm not a poet, but I will try. Um, the Earth is incredible. Now, the best way I try to describe what the Earth looks like is if you can imagine every beautiful picture that you've ever seen of flowers, or rainbows, or uh, a bride on her wedding day, or a new baby, or animals out in uh, blue bonnets, whatever it is. Take all those pictures and put them end to end and tape them together and now put them on a roll and pull that roll past your face at a fast speed. You can't, you can't get more than just a kind of a glimpse of each of those and each one is more beautiful and, and overwhelming and you want to say stop it, I want to look at that longer. That's what it's like to look at the earth from on orbit. Incredible views constantly changing, the mosaics and colors and the worst thing is that our cameras, even the electronic ones we have now, still do not capture the hues and the colors and the beauty of what the human eye can see. That's probably one of the most frustrating things to me is that you cannot bring back what you can actually see. Uh, the moon itself probably doesn't look a whole lot different than it does out here in Gilmer on a beautiful winter night when there's no lights around. Uh, you can see it about as well as you can see it from on orbit. The stars, you get to see a lot more stars because you're going around the world every 90 minutes. So you get to see the stars here, but you also get to see the stars that the people in Australia get to see, which we never get to see because they're in the Southern Hemisphere. And the other things you get to see is you get to see um, the auroras every once in a while. You get to see an aurora, either over the Southern uh, Pole or the Northern Pole. I can remember on uh, my sixth space shuttle flight, after we had finished our assembly work on the International Space Station, we had undocked and we were getting ready to come back home. And one night we were passing over Canada. And it was uh, dark out. And a couple of us were up looking out the aft windows at the ground, but there was something else going on. It almost looked like fog or something outside. So we turned down all of the lights inside so we didn't have the reflection on the windows and so we could see outside better. And by golly, we were flying right through an aurora. And it was, it was white. It was not green or some other colors. It was white. And it kind of looked like, you know, the old-fashioned sheer white drapes, uh, curtains. Uh, and it was just moving around, and it was all over the place. And we called the rest of the crew members up to the windows, and everybody for about the next five or ten minutes as we were flying over Canada were just going, ooh, ah, look at that. I mean, that's about all we can say. It was, it was so faint that there's no way we could capture it on video or on a camera. But what an incredible treat. Of course, we're all going, okay, so am I going to glow tomorrow or what's going on? <laughs> but incredible views. Incredible views. How about over here? You all been really quiet. How did you sneak your Bible on? How did I sneak my Bible on? Uh, I didn't have to sneak it on. Um, on my, uh, my last flight, on earlier flights, they had uh, space limitations, both volume and weight on how much you could carry up with you. But my, my last flight, they had relaxed those somewhat. 
And so I was able to carry my Bible up with me and uh, basically every night, uh, I slept on the International Space Station for the seven nights I was up there. And every night I got a chance to, uh, to read some of the Bible and, and what an incredible feeling to be able to uh, do that. And, and sometimes I'd go up to the orbiter's windows and look out at God's beautiful creation and read from uh, Genesis and things like that. Uh, still runs, uh, chills up my spine. What an incredible, incredible opportunity. One or two more questions? Oh. Um, just this last week, I was thinking how hard it would be to sleep in space because there's no concept of down. Was that a trouble for you? Or? Okay, the question was, uh, was it hard to sleep in space primarily because there's no down? Down doesn't make any difference in zero gravity. The thing that made it hard for me to sleep in space was because of the adrenaline level that I had going. Uh, I, I don't know if you can go to sleep after riding six and a half million pounds of thrust into orbit or not. Uh, I had a heck of a time doing that. And uh, for about six or seven days on orbit, I never got much sleep. My first four flights, um, which were anywhere between four and a half days and ten days, I never got more than five hours of sleep on any given night. And, uh, and I didn't want to. Uh, the schedule keeps you so busy that you really don't have time to go to the windows and really absorb what you can look at from the ground. And plus that, our orbits, uh, uh, because of the, or the orbits we're in, we are flying over different parts of the ground under daylight conditions during our sleep periods. So if you want to see, let's say, Australia, it may have been uh, on uh, the dark side of the Earth when we were going over it when, during your work period, but if you stay up and when everybody else is supposed to be sleeping, including yourself, then you can look out and see Australia and some other parts of the world. So uh, that's what I did. I stayed up and, and watched out the windows as much as I could. I figured I could sleep it when I got home. And you never knew. I mean, you never knew if you're going to get another opportunity to fly in space or not, or you know, the program was going to end, or you were going to get sick, or your boss is going to tell you you're fired, or who knows. You know. So I took the opportunities to enjoy the view while I could. The funny, the hardest part about getting to sleep in space is uh, two things. One is uh, just making your mind shut down, so it's adrenaline or whatever you want to call it. And the other one is, most of the time, most of us had a, a, a lower back pain. And that's because I think primarily, we all tried to go into a little bit of a fetal position in zero gravity. And when you do that, if you tense up the, your stomach muscles for hours on end, that starts to get some pain in the lower back. And if you really allow yourself to totally rack, relax in zero gravity, it's almost like you're arching your back backwards and your, your stomach is sticking out and that's when you have totally relaxed all the muscles and your back pain goes away. I had to experiment to figure that out myself, so. Another question? Does it smell like an airplane smells like? Does it smell like an airplane smells like? Um, I don't know, what does an airplane smell like? <laughs> Uh, there's no uh, burnt uh, JP4 or anything like that smell, uh, you know, kerosene smell. Uh, the the or orders, orbiters all smelled about the same, and there really was not much of a, a smell associated with them. Uh, maybe around meal times you could smell the different aromas from the foods and things like that. But overall, the, uh, the odor removal systems in the, in the vehicle worked pretty well. I will tell you that when we came back in from spacewalks, there was a smell in, on the spacesuits and in the airlock that uh, was somewhat irritating or not nice to smell. I likened it to kind of like a, a hot electric or a burnt electric smell. You know, if you had some electronic equipment that got hot and kind of cooked off a little bit, that's kind of what the smell like to me. And it's interesting because on my sixth flight, I had a Russian crew member who helped us get in and out of our spacesuits. And when, we, when he came into the airlock after one of our spacewalks, he said, ah, the smell of space. So he had recognized it from spacewalks that he'd done with his equipment on the Russian space station. So it's, it's not just our suit that smells that way when you come back inside. And I'm not sure if it's monotonic oxygen or it's ultraviolet rays or what it is, but there's something that's causing a little bit of a, a smell on the, uh, the exterior materials of the spacesuit after they've been outside for a while. Yes, sir. 
Yeah. Yeah, we keep the, the pressure in the International Space Station at around 14.7 pounds per square inch. And it's basically a 80% nitrogen, 20% oxygen. Uh, so it's, it's basically a sea level environment. And it's a shirt sleeve temperature. If you've ever seen the pictures of the guys up there, they're all running around and sometimes in shorts or cutoffs and, uh, and t-shirts. Yes, ma'am. Ah, good question. How long does it take to adjust after you get back? Um, I've been one of the fortunate ones that didn't have any problems transitioning to zero gravity or coming back. I can tell you that for about the first half hour after you get back on the ground, you feel extremely heavy. And uh, on most of my flights, when I first tried to stand up from the seat after landing, I, I didn't move. And it felt like somebody glued my britches to the seat. And so I had to put out what I thought was an extraordinary amount of effort just to stand up. And we're, we're sweating profusely because we're fighting gravity. You don't know how much gravity hurts until you've been away from it for a while. It's, it really is pretty amazing. Uh, and then about after about a half hour or so, uh, I need to keep my legs a little bit further apart just to keep my center of gravity so I'm not going to tip over. But I almost start to feel like I'm light, like I can, I'm, I'm not you know, really being uh, held down by gravity totally. And in fact, for the first couple of nights after I'm on the ground normally, I don't feel like I'm really compressed into the bed when I'm getting ready to go to sleep. And, it, and it's not me daydreaming that I'm floating. I think it's that the touch sensors all over the body, the bottom of the feet and all over the body, have been detuned, desensitized a little bit, such that they're not putting out the same amount of signal that you would expect you know, after you've been here on the ground for a while. So it's kind of interesting that after a day or so, that all goes away. Uh, but I, I normally will not go out. I did not go out and run or do any heavy exercise for about the first four or five days after I got home. I had some friends that would go out running the next day, and several of them uh, broke bones or tripped and got hurt or something like that. So I figured just give the body a chance to get reacclimated a little bit and then, and then go work out again. Okay. Well, uh, Richard, thank you for inviting me, and thank you for coming this evening, and I hope you learned a little bit about the space program, and I hope you enjoyed the book. Thank you. Gary will be available following there's a table set up back over there somewhere that has uh, books on it. They're $30. He will autograph it. You're going to take a picture with Jerry, take a few minutes, and I ask another question or visit. I think you'll be happy to do that. I am remiss in that I did not mention dinner. The uh, Methodist Church here, and all churches, I guess, but ours in particular, has some guys that just love to cook. And the Methodist men are responsible for our dinner. Are some of you guys here, Gary, some of you all still here? There we go. Thank you. And the last thing before we turn to the tickets is Jerry, want to. Uh, oh, Jerry's getting some water. Okay. Uh, have uh, something I want to give to uh, Northeast Texas Child Advocacy Center. Uh, Jerry's getting some water, but I'll just go ahead and do this, and he's going to head back to the table. The uh, program tonight with the agenda is uh, for everybody, and this particular copy we framed, it says to the Northeast Texas Child Advocacy Center, thank you for all you do to help our kids. God's blessing, and sign Jerry Ross. So if you take that back with you.